Welcome back to the channel. This is Plenary Session Podcast, video and audio edition. I'll give the same plug I've given before. If you're listening to the audio version, I want you to hit the pause button and go take a look at the video. For my ASCO coverage, I'm doing a lot of visuals, and as they say, a picture's worth a thousand words. Now look, I'm not happy about it either. I'm like you. I prefer to listen to content audio only when I'm on the go. I don't got time to look at any videos, but for this, make an exception, I urge you, make an exception. We have done two videos previously on this channel. We've done, of course, Shine. That great trial, that Ibrutinib BR versus BR trial, that's shining a piece of, well, you know, you know what it is. We've also done CT guided DNA in the adjuvant setting, and I think that's dynamic, dynamic. Here we're doing determination, the third one, determination. We're gonna do Destiny Breast 4, don't worry, we're coming to that. And we might even do that Luis Diaz uh, locally advanced rectal cancer paper, New England Journal. But we're gonna we're gonna do a lot of these. I'm gonna try to do as many as I can. I gotta do determination. This is we are determined to keep doing transplant. That's what they might as well have called it. We're determined to do it, and that's the response. So let's just hit it. Okay, this is multiple myeloma. We're we're switching a lot of hats here. First, we are in the um, mantle cell lymphoma space. Then we're in the um, adjuvant stage two colon space, and now we're in multiple myeloma, my favorite stomping ground. You know me, I love, love thinking about multiple myeloma, and I had a blistering podcast a few weeks ago where I talked about how it's a field that probably is one of the most captured because you have so many randomized control trials, and you just don't even know basics. What's the best second-line therapy? Does anyone actually have a survival benefit from auto? Uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And there are many other questions. And what is even the best frontline therapy? There's a huge debate about that because there's lack of good head-to-head -head comparative trials. We get determination. Now, this is triplet therapy, transplantation, and maintenance until progression in multiple myeloma. Richardson and colleagues, New England Journal is out now. I've got a lot to say about this. Let's hit it. The burden of proof. I got to start by talking about the burden of proof. Now, we know that unlike other disease settings, autotransplant in multiple myeloma is supported by randomized control trials. From 19 diggity 2, it's supported by old studies and back in the day when all you had was some melphalan, some vincristine, and some cyclophosphamide. It was a wise idea to do an autotransplant. You had a survival benefit. But then, what happened? We had imids, we had thalidomide, and lenalidomide, and pomalidomide, and we had proteasome inhibitors, carfilzomib, and bortezomib, and we had CD38 antibodies, daratumumab, and that other one that has no purpose because it costs the same and has no other value or niche. I, you know who you're talking about. We've had an explosion of other categories of drugs, including now we're moving to bites and CAR-T and BCMA as a car target and uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many things in multiple myeloma now and so many different combinations, retreating, giving something that somebody hadn't seen before again, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we're at a point where it's just a totally different ball game. And in this new ball game, the era of novel therapies, I think there are only really two studies that assess the value of transplantation. There's the IFM 2009 study, and there is this study, determination. The other studies just don't count. That's a bygone era. The next thing I want to say, the burden of proof. The burden of proof when you take a patient for autologous stem cell transplant is on the transplanter. It's not on the patient. It's on the transplanter. Remember, we did auto transplants for breast cancer. Women underwent that procedure, believing they'd live longer, live better. That turned out not to be true in six pooled randomized controlled trials. And this is the question in the modern era for the patients we're seeing in our clinic. Can you tell a patient, look them in the eyes and tell them by offering you this procedure, people like you on average live longer, live better. You need to be able to say that to even offer something in biomedicine. You can't just say, oh, I know there's a PFS benefit. There's no OS benefit. The quality of life is actually not so great. You can't say all those things and put the burden on the patient. The burden is on the doctor and the profession to justify why we're doing what we're doing. You know, we have to prove under what circumstances our therapies work. And you know what? There are these flip-flops in medicine that happen from evolving standard of care. And in fact, aspirin and healthy people might just be one. Uh, but this is certainly in that bucket. The old trials don't don't count. We got two trials in the modern world. Okay, the next point. There are only two things patients care about, quantity of life and quality of life. They care about how long they live and the quality of their life for that journey. Okay, those are the two things they care about. They don't sit around thinking, my 
MRD level is 1 times 10 to the power minus 7. Now, they don't think that. The doctor has to tell them about MRD. And once you tell somebody about MRD, it's a scary boogeyman. I mean, it can loom on your shoulder. Just like you, we used to tell patients, you didn't achieve CR. And that can be sort of um, some sort of burden that they face. We should be very careful before telling people all this information without knowing that that information is useful or can be lead to improved outcomes. Okay, so they care about living longer, living better. That's what we're going to talk about. The next thing I want to say, the elephant in the room, auto transplants are big money. They're lucrative. They put food on the table. I have a quote here that says they have a mean payer cost of almost $150,000. I think that's the mean payer cost in, in one study. And there may be a range. And I know, I know, I know this to be true. I know some people who early in their career, they came out hot, guns blazing. They said the era novel drugs, you don't need to transplant in CR1. They said that. And then they had a little talking to by their cancer center director saying, listen here, you can talk all that stuff you want when you're working somewhere else. But when you're working here, we need to keep this gravy train going. And so I think we have to acknowledge that the financial bias at every single center, the bias is to do the transplant and to look with the most rose-colored glasses that this is a favorable, favorable data and do the transplant. That, we got to say that's the, that's the overall field-wise bias, okay? Come on, let's be honest. All right. With that in mind, will be a fair and impartial look at this determination. Professional bias. Ah, I got one more bias here. Okay, I think we also have to acknowledge that somebody who's in the auto transplant business, it's more than a financial bias for them. It's the thing they do for a living. It's one's livelihood, and that's more than money. And we've seen this before. When the urologists were threatened with the loss of PSA, their heads exploded. <laughs> they couldn't believe it. That's a lot of business for somebody who's in the robot. When you train on that robot to do the prostate surgery, and that's your thing, that's your whole livelihood, that robot, for them to not do that PSA just blows your whole career. And finally, they found a way to keep themselves occupied with active surveillance. We, you know, That's a bone that we toss to them rather than you know have them prove under what circumstances their screening test actually improves outcomes. Uh, we didn't ask them to do that. We just tossed them the bone of active surveillance, kept them busy, but at least you know distracted them from this fight. They're, le they're less passionate about it than they were a few years ago. Okay, th this is what I'm talking about. If you're only in the auto transplant myeloma business, and by the way, there are a lot of people only in that business. They're just like the person who works in the hospital, and they just do the autos on the myelomas. They don't do the early stuff, and they don't do auto autos on Hodgkin's. They just do the automyeloma people. They're automyeloma people. That's a huge bias. I mean, I don't know. You are literally a hammer, okay? You don't want to replace all the nails with screws. You're, you're, you are a hammer. Your body is in the shape of a hammer. Okay, we got to acknowledge that. These are real. This is the real bias. Okay, now let's talk about the paper. The first thing I got to say is, you know me, I'm always griping about medical writers. Why? I don't know. This is you can either consider either medicine is part of the scholarship of the university or it's not. You can say it's a technical craft and actually we're not real professors if you want to. I mean, I prefer not to, but you might say that. But if you're going to say your professor, the way the English professors are professor or the philosophy professor is a professor, you got to write your own scholarship. There's no, there's no world where other people, you can pay someone money and they can write your novel for you and then you're the English professor. That doesn't exist in their world. It only exists in our world. And I'm always fault these medical writers. They're paid by the company and you know, they have uh, the silver tongue. They know just how to put things so that it's in the optimal, the optimal uh, portrayal to favor the product. And I thought to myself, well, you know, at least, you know, for an NIH-funded study, I ain't never seen a medical writer until now. <laughs> Actually, preparation of an earlier version of the manuscript was paid for by the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Dana-Farber's paying for their faculty to outsource the, the writing? You know what it smells like to me? It smells like somebody's got a bit of a slush fund at the university. Okay, anyway, the next thing it says is the R.J. Corman Multiple Myeloma Research Fund. You're saying that you're using research funds? Are these donated money? Do you think somebody donated money to multiple myeloma so some doctor didn't have to write up their own paper? Is this really what we've come to? That people are so lazy to write their own paper, they got to pay for this even when they're not even, it's not even pharma doing it anymore? And then it looks in the last part of the manuscript. Steve Hill from Ashfield Medcoms of Ashfield Health Company, medical writing at existing blah, 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 blah. They're using medical writers. Get out of here, man. I don't know what to tell you. This is ridiculous. How is there not I mean, how is there not a junior faculty at your university you could throw a bone to, make him second author, have him do all the writing and help you with parts of this? Is that is that not an option? Or have somebody worked on the trial, maybe? There's so many authors of the trial, none of these people can write, write it up. Somebody who needs like a career boost, maybe. I don't know. We really got to do this? Really? I mean, is this really what it's come to? The next point. 
the primary endpoint was progression-free survival. And I see people saying, well, the only thing you can consider when the primary endpoint is progression-free survival is progression-free survival. The primary endpoint is progression-free survival. We have set the primary endpoint for progression-free survival. Why don't they say this? Isn't that pretty stupid? You knew, you knew that one arm is going to get a lethal dose of melphalan and salvage stem cells, and the other arm isn't. Hmm, might progression-free survival be a stupid endpoint because it's, of course, going to be extended by this thing where it's always been extended? Might the more realistic, reasonable, practical, useful endpoint be overall survival? You're running your trial for progression-free survival? What are you doing? And then you're going to use that as an excuse later to, to say that, well, that's all we can consider here. Come on, get out of here. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Why is the government paying for this? And actually, there's a rule in biomedicine, I think people forget, that a trial that's incapable of answering a useful clinical question is by default unethical and should not be done. Um, and I think we have to ask ourselves, are we, are we getting there? If, we're picking P if you're saying the only thing you can interpret from this PFS, I actually don't think that's true, but we'll talk about that. Statistical analysis. Sample size, 720, 90% power to 30% lower disease progression or death in the transplant group. This would correspond to hazard ratio 1.4. Okay, you know, it's not unreasonable. I mean, the power calc, but I mean, I think, um, you know, should have been OS, of course. That's through the primary endpoint. Let's look at overall survival. Those are the two key goals of life. Living longer, living better. Living longer or living better, I always say. Only two things people care about. When it comes to overall survival... There's an old saying, if you can fit the laser pointer between the curves, you can give the plenary session the national meeting. Well, you could give the plenary session in the meeting this time, but you can't fit a laser pointer between these curves because there ain't no difference. 90 events, 88 events. The denominator is about 350, 360. We're talking about roughly one-third event rate and nothing. One out of every th one out of three people have had the event. Nothing. No difference. This isn't just the, the total number of deaths at some landmark time. This is a time-to-event analysis here, people. The hazard ratio, 1.1. P-value, 0.99. Does it get any higher than that? Does it get any less significant than that? You're going to try to say, it's trending. It's trending towards something. <laughs> it's trending towards 0.05. It's only 0.99. I don't know. What are you going to say? Um, and then they have the little bond for anything in the comments. Sure. Yeah, I, I get it. Okay. One third of the people died roughly. It's time to event. So it's got, you know, a lot of ability in this graph to say it don't look like nothing much is going on. It looks like this is not going to have a survival benefit. It looks as negative as negative can look. Somebody said, well, you know, you can't look at OS until the median is reached. You can't say it's equal, roughly the same. Uh, yeah, you can. You can, of course. And then you're flipping the entire burden. This is not a trial that's designed in power to show equivalent OS or even non-inferior OS from omitting transplantation. Although, you know, they could call the folks up in that get the stage two colon cancer and run a trial like that you know do a huge non-inferiority margin run a non-inferior os sure i guess you could do that this is a trial designed to show the superiority of the toxic costly thing that kills people transplant and you know you see nothing it's not even budging um no you don't have to wait for the median the other point i want to make is this is the big difference between ifm 2009 and this study and it's the rate of subsequent transplantation i think in that study it was in the high 70s now we're at 28 percent so this is really sobering. This really means that if you're not doing the transplant in CR1 on the control arm, there's a great chance, a great chance, you're never going to have to do the transplant. You're never going to have to come in the hospital for one month. You're never going to have to, you know, leave all the fresh flowers out there at the nursing station. You're never going to have to be away from your family like these, some young people have young kids at home, and then somehow there's a hospital, some draconian policy that some kid under 12 can't be there. You're never going to have to be apart from people for so long. You're never going to have that convalescence at home you're really getting away without having to do it i mean with this rate of post-progression therapy that's really remarkable that's what sets it apart it really i think is actually much more negative for these transplanters than they would like and that's why they're in full spin cycle they hit that washing machine to turn it right to spin cycle hit that spin cycle quick hit that quick because this is not good news for them quality of life i'm going to show you the quality of life here now people are like oh you know, it's good to know the transplant just kicks you in the face for a little bit of time and then it wears off. You know, it's only a little bit of misery. Uh, yeah, that's a significant decrement in quality of life when you're undergoing the transplant. And you've got to imagine that you keep saying that PFS is so, 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 so important. It's so important for patients they may want to delay the PFS. Like 20 months, it's huge. It's a huge delay of PFS. And what that means is in the clinic, practically, we all know those people who like, 
the light chains just start to creep up. You start to worry. You know, they just start to come up a little bit. You start to worry and you talk to them. Well, you know, it's a little bit. We'll check it again. And your people start to worry a little bit. The whole progression cascade is presumably being pushed way into the future with transplant. And what that should mean is that in year one, year two, year three, the quality of life on the transplant arm should be getting better and better and better because they're not going to have to deal with that progression or even the thought that they might progress in the future because there's just a little, little uptick, little uptick in their free light chain, little uptick in their M protein. They don't have to worry about that because you punted that way into the future, right? And if that were true, you'd see a big benefit in health-related quality of life in years two and three. And you don't. You don't see, you know, just a little bit of separation. I guess the real question that I want to see, and I haven't read the protocol in detail, and somebody can tell me in the comments of this, but I would imagine that like many protocols, that once the person comes off protocol, they're not going to do the ERTC form in perpetuity. But what we really, really want in myeloma is we need a cohort of people, and we really need to collect health-related quality of life questionnaires for the entire myeloma journey. Just start collecting it now. It'll be really useful, in, in, you know, because I want to know the people who underwent transplant, that 28%, what was the decrement in health-related quality of life when they did it in the future, and does that offset the decrement up front? I doubt it because it's only like roughly one in four people rather than everybody who had to do it. Um, you know, and I want to know what is the quality of life in the subsequent progressions? That's relevant. Quality of life is not something you measure only on protocol. And the paper that proves that is the paper by Allison Haslam and myself in JAMA Network Open on the duration of measurement of health-related quality of life. Came out, I think, in 2020. Take a look at that paper. All right. So I guess I, I think when I look at this, it looks like transplant has failed, failed to improve overall survival. Remember, the burden of proof was on the transplanter. To improve it, they failed to improve overall survival. They have no hint that they're going to do anything there. There's nothing going. There's nothing percolating. It's a quiet, quiet abdomen. There's no sounds at all there. Nothing is happening on that front. And they look like they have a health-related quality of life decrement from their thing that is not offset by a later improvement in health-related quality of life from delaying potentially bad news to the patient. So it's not looking good for them, in my opinion. Progression-free survival was better, okay? You know, myeloma progression, you know, it can be light chains. It can be fracture. It can be explosive disease. It can be all sorts of things. What exactly this means, that's why you need health-related quality of life. It is better, you know? It is what it is. This is it, okay? But I think it's sort of not very useful as a primary endpoint when one side is getting a ton more therapy. Here I've kind of tried to play with the axes to show you that we got to, like, progression-free survival data out for, you know, five, six years on this. But the health-related quality of life is only being shown for the first 36 months. I'm trying to line everything up vertically here. You know, but the point I want to make here is that you still see significant separation in progression and still no commensurate change in health-related quality of life favoring transplant, post-transplant, as one might expect, because all that bad news is being pushed in the future. Presumably that would translate into some feeling of better, you know, you're doing better when you're filling out that form, and you just don't see that. Treatment-related adverse events. I haven't seen figures like this since the uh, breast cancer studies back in the day. I mean, of course, transplant has more toxicity. It's transplant. The other arm didn't get transplant. So, you know, what am I to think? No surprise. Here's what I liked. The lack of an overall survival benefit of RVD plus stem cell transplant is probably associated with the multiple highly effective options available after first-line therapy that emerged over the past, and I think it says 10 years. Well, isn't that an argument that you no longer need to do this? The burden was on you in the modern era of new drugs to show me that this improves my quantity or quality of life. You have failed to do both in now two studies that are both negative. The first one had a high rate of crossover. The second one has a much lower rate of crossover, but it fails just as hard to do that. And now it's costly. It's toxic. It has a short-term decrement in quality of life that's not offset by any detectable improvement in quality of life later. And we have all these new options and more options just flooding, flooding, flooding the market. We got another one in New England Journal, uh, uh, which I'm going to review, I think, uh, to Clistamab. Um, and uh, I, I think this is, um, you know, this is, this is not good for them. Next point. Here's what they write in their discussion. 
I'm glad they pay the medical writer. However, the elimination of minimal residual disease is of increasing importance in tailoring treatment and informing clinical care and a treatment goal, given its prognostic value for better outcomes. Increasingly high rates of elimination of MRD are associated with new, new four drug regimens incorporating highly efficacious, highly efficacious monoclonal antibodies. Our preliminary data are supportive of this regard. Despite similar rates of conventional response between the two groups, RVD plus stem cell transplant result in a higher rate of patients in whom MRD was not detected. Well, guess what? You've actually made a case for that MRD is not a surrogate marker <laughs> because you've improved MRD and you've not even budged your OS. MRD is not suitable for regulatory purposes. It's not a surrogate marker. It's not going to speed drugs to market and allow Janssen to have a ticker tape parade all over the streets with a boon of drugs. MRD is not suited. It's making that case. You know, I guess you don't see which way it's cutting here. <laughs> You're like, what? This is a really important prognostic marker, but you didn't improve the thing that it's supposed to be prognosticating. Okay. What are you doing? What are you doing? Whew. All right. Come on. And then all the people who said the only thing, the only thing this trial can look at is PFS. That's the only thing because that's primary point. Can't look at OS. Don't you look at that. Don't you look at that OS. But let, let, me, let me show you this MRD here. <laughs> let, me show, let me show you MRD. We really got to look at MRD here. Okay, I know it's not the priority, but just don't look at OS. Looking at OS is like looking at the sun during an eclipse. You just don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. You have to wear these special glasses to look at OS. But MRD, MRD is like looking, it's like looking at the moon. You can always, you can always look at MRD. It's always, it's always special. It's always beautiful. It's always beautiful. Okay, that's ridiculous, ridiculous logic. <laughs> I don't know. Do people even like think through what their arguments are here? Okay. PFS by subgroup. You know, I don't I saw that this slide was there and they had like highlighted these things. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Why'd you put the red box around this stuff and not the other? Because you, what are you talking about? <laughs> okay. When you interpret, when you interpret the forest plot subgroups, it's really difficult because, of course, there are infinite direct like degrees of freedom. You can look at this many, many ways. What should you actually be looking at? I think the only thing you can look at is like roughly, is the point estimate and confidence interval roughly in the same direction? And if it's roughly in the same direction, then, you know, we can say that we don't have any strong evidence to suspect that there is a treatment interaction here, it's roughly in the same direction. Now, if you were really good and you knew what you're doing, like the recovery trial investigators, you'd crank that sample size up so big that you could do the pre-specified subgroup analyses and power an interaction statistic looking for a p-value that it actually interacts by that. And they, in fact, found that. That's the reason why we gave Dex in mechanical ventilation and O2, but not in hospital, not on O2, because they had power for interaction. These people don't got power for that. They don't got power. They don't even get. They don't got power for OS. They think they got power for looking at subgroup interactions. No, they just put that divide p by 0. 0.7, divide divide 0. 0.05 by seven in the little the side of the little diagram. Okay, um, they don't have power for this. Um, I don't know. Are they trying? Were they talking about racial differences? I don't think. No, I would assume. I, my interpretation of this is that there would be no reason to suspect any differences by race. Um, I'm glad that they have actually included African Americans in this uh, trial. Uh, perhaps we would do that more often in the future. I think that would be very important because this is a disease that has a disproportionate impact on African Americans. BMI? Are they trying to say that low BMI is benefiting them? I don't. <laughs> what do you? I don't know. I would interpret nothing out of that. I would nothing out of the ISS. Nothing out about the RISS. I mean, there's nothing to interpret here. I don't know why they even showed it and put those little red boxes around. I wish I had been there. Actually, no, I didn't. I'm glad I'm, I'm glad I'm looking at this with fresh eyes. I don't want to know what they're thinking. There's a positive note. Let me end this video with some positive notes. The first positive note. Mani Moyudin, he's the, he's the great hope in multiple myeloma. They've been years of waiting for the... It was, one, it was once prophesized in multiple myeloma that there would be a dark age. And in the dark age, there would be a proliferation of industry-sponsored clinical trials. The NCCN would literally recommend every single drug every KOL or near every KOL would be receiving personal payments from the biopharmaceutical industry and they would be competing in a race to the bottom for who to put their name as first and last author to do the most inappropriate or flawed study. Boston was prophesized as being the worst, but there was always the myth, the myth that there would someday be the one, the great hope in myeloma who would come and correct the field. And uh, I mean, actually it's a great, it's a great place for mythology story. I'm hoping that it's Monty because I think he's the person who might do it. He might pull it off. Here's what he writes. I'm a transplanter, but this will, make me slightly, this will make me slightly less likely to do early transplant for all. 
despite no auto and low crossover control live long due to effective subsequent treatments and were spared the toxicity of auto this will only get better with new therapies car t and bites good for him he's absolutely right the only way to interpret this is that you should be much less likely perhaps very much less likely to do this and to be honest i mean if you're an insurer i think this is a great place that it's time to regulate they're determined well you can regulate them because i think that you know they don't really have much of a leg to stand on but i'll make another point about insurers i think people are really people are always worried that the insurer is some boogeyman trying to like lower health care payments because they make more money you understand the medical loss ratio the medical loss ratio capitates their profit as a fraction of revenue at point two and as long as that's the case it's like me telling you that, you know, I'm going to buy a pizza and you're allowed to eat 20% of the pizza and you're really, really hungry. What size pizza should I buy? The answer is extra large. And so actually insurers do have sort of, I think, even a long-term incentive to grow healthcare spending. So they're not always the boogeyman you think they are. You don't really understand their incentives. They have incentives to buffer year to year variability, et cetera. I don't want to get into it all. But anyway, let's just say I do think that there is place for payers. Maybe Medicare. Medicare. Come on. Medicare, step up. Step up, Medicare. They, 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 you paid for the study and they got the medical writer to write it using their research funds, but you know, you can cut it. You can cut the payments to this and you ought to, because I think this needs to be discouraged now. Um, Aaron Goodman, my other great hope. I agree. As a transplanter data suggests, it's very reasonable to delay until relapse and maybe not to do for some. Good for you, Aaron. You're right, sir. For a moment, I wanted to say there's a hope here that we would just take the people with high risk cytogenetic profiles and do consider them for transplant. And maybe what we could do is a, like a future study just in the high risk group, randomizing to transplant in CR1 versus not, and even powering it for OS. And I saw this 54% RVD alone, 63%. That's like a 9% difference in five year OS. And I was like getting excited, like, wow, maybe there's a hint of like, this is going to be good for these people. And we could like run that validation study to prove that that's the case. I was getting excited. And then I looked at the forest plot. I looked at the forest plot, you know, and, you know, I don't know what to say that I didn't put all those little red boxes around it because it's a wash. I mean, it's a total wash. And even if you go down to fish cytogenetics and you look at high risk, you know, the point estimate is, you know, as close to one as you can get. And uh, yes, it's 54 and 63, but you know, in translocation 414, it's 64 and 65. And then in deletion 17P, it's 53.8 and 55.3. You know, and, you know, it's, it's, it's like, uh, it's just like such small data sets and like, I don't know. You know what, and how do they even get 29? They got 20 and 10. Shouldn't that add up to that number up there? I gotta look at this a little bit more later because now it's when I feel my spidey sense is tingling. I gotta look at that later. But anyway, you know, it's a wash. I guess I would say that I actually don't conclude that there's any group I would run a prospective study. Okay. That's that. Um, closing thoughts. Closing thoughts. This is the determination study, as in we determined to keep doing this. The thing about medicine is you got to be You've got to be in evidence evidence first and the thing you do next. I mean, I got to say, I practice oncology now as an attending for seven years and, you know, three years before that as a fellow. So it's been a decade for me in oncology. I've never once felt very wedded to any particular drug or therapy or regimen. I don't have, I don't have any sort of strong, you know, sentimentality to it. Um, I have done transplant. I've attended on the service many, many times. I used to love to attend on the service because I think it's a good, good medicine. But I think we have to be very careful that we don't let those professional biases supersede our interpretation of evidence. I also think we have to acknowledge the amount of money that's flowing here, and we have to acknowledge that there, you know, there are people like this person I, I once knew who was, you know, vehement in his, um, in his meteoric early career against tra routine transplant in CR1, and was told to pipe down about it. I think we have to acknowledge that is their bias. The university wants you to pipe down because that's putting food on the table. Now we have two randomized control trials, and there ain't no lick of improvement in OS. And this occurred in the setting of low crossover. You can't even hang your head on that. Um, I think you need to do either a very large mega study to settle this once and for all. Maybe CMS should actually put auto transplant for myeloma and CR1 as part of coverage with evidence development. CMS, that's a great idea, actually. I just thought of it as I'm talking. You take Medicare, you take transplant, CR1, myeloma, and you make it coverage with evidence development 
so that the only way you'll pay for it is in the context of a randomized controlled trial. We have totally have equipoise here. We don't know how to improve survival quality of life. You make a very simple pragmatic trial. Anybody who wants it, they'll be randomized, one-to-one -one randomization, either get it or don't get it. Two primary endpoints, overall survival, and global health-related quality of life over the entirety of your cancer journey. That's the only way you pay, pay for it. The control arm has nothing to worry about. They are gonna be spared a transplant in CR1, and there's no proof it improves survival or quality of life. And uh, so it's totally fine to be on that. The intervention arm, they're going to do it. And then we will really settle once and for all whether or not this has any transplant survival benefit. And you won't have to wait till the median is reached, by the way. You'll get a crushing sample size on that. You can crush this out. In fact, I didn't crunch the numbers, but I wouldn't be surprised if you get an answer in, in one to three years um, because of just the sheer number of transplants we do in this country. Okay, those are my thoughts. That's the way to solve the problem, determination. We determined to use that medical writer even if pharma's not paying, and we determined to give this the spin cycle. I disagree. I think this is really bad for transplant. I would be shorting transplant for myeloma CR1. I think if I was a patient, I, I personally wouldn't want it. I was already kind of like not wanting it before, but now I really wouldn't want it. You know, it's not fun to get an auto. It's miserable. I mean, you really want to be away for a month? I mean, that's misery, and it's not like you're away in, on a beach you're away in the hospital, the worst hospital. The hospital is miserable to be there. Um, they put the, I mean, everything about it is a miserable experience, including the, I have to say one thing, it's just a side note that really bothers me, the pillow. Like you, you can't, we don't even, you don't even give people like a normal pillow. The pillow has got that like coated in impermeable wax or something, you know, some plastic pillow, because people are really worried that, um, I don't know, that it would, it, somebody would eventually contaminate the, the, the inside of the pillow. So they put this pillow, but then you have this really thin pillowcase, and the result is when you actually sleep on that pillow, you're going to get a sweaty face and acne. It's just one of the small things, but part of the misery of being in the hospital. You know, I, I think it's small, but it's really emblematic of how we, we're happy to pay for some transplant for somebody without a proven OS benefit. But if somebody wants like a blanket that isn't the worst blanket you've ever seen in your life or like a comfy pillow, the healthcare system can't pay for that. I think it's a tragedy. I'd rather you, you pay for some comforts and you pay for somebody to come to somebody's house and take care of them and, and you pay less for, you know, costly, expensive interventions that don't make you live longer, live better. And, you know, what are we doing as a society? It's embarrassing. So those are my thoughts. Determination. If you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. I'm going to do all the ASCO papers. You're going to get the real plenary session on plenary session. You're not going to get the real plenary session there. And by the way, now it's Sunday. It's over. So if, uh, Monday. Monday is a ghost town there. Watch this channel, recommend it to a friend, forward it to somebody in oncology. Until next time.